we are learning about pleasing God. If you talk about a life after bondage, a life after chains, it's about pleasing God. And I want to make a distinction here. Um, we didn't drive this point home too heavily last week, but I want to di distinguish the difference between pleasing God, Yahweh, and appeasing God. There is a difference. There is a difference. Pleasing God is about w loving God and wanting God to truly be happy. Do you want God to be happy? When you want somebody to be happy, you will do things that you don't want to do. You will do things because they need them or want them. If you want them to be happy, you will give them what they say they want, the way they want it. Amen? Amen. As opposed to appeasing, which is to give the minimum, to barely make it, just to avoid some negative consequence. We're talking about pleasing God rather than appeasing. And frankly, our God, the one true and living God, cannot be appeased. It's only the gods that we've made up in our heads, the fake gods, the idol gods, that we either make with our hands or look to the heavens and claim a god. Those are the gods that people have, over time, tried to appease. Because natural disasters come, and we have attributed those disasters to some gods in the skies. And so we give gifts to them, or in historically we have, in order to try to avoid those natural disasters. That's appeasement. And our God is not looking for that. He's looking to be pleased. He's looking for a relationship with a creation that loves him truly. And we learned that lesson last week through the story of Cain and Abel. We broke that all the way down. Amen? Amen. For those of you who were here, my prayer is that you were blessed by it. Uh, we broke down Cain and Abel. We saw that Abel brought a sacrifice to God that God was pleased with. He brought it, he brought his first and his best to God. And so therefore God was pleased and he acknowledged Abel's sacrifice. Whereas on the other hand, Cain brought his sacrifice with the wrong attitude, his way, brought what he wanted, and God didn't even acknowledge it. But this triggered anger and envy on the part of Cain. And ultimately, God talked to Cain. He tried to give Cain some counsel, wisdom. And we came to understand uh, the difference between one who is committed to loving and pleasing God and one who is not. And we're going to go back there just a little bit today because we're going to tie these two things together uh, between last week and this week. Uh, while Cain was still angry, yet before he killed his brother, God taught us some things through teaching him some things. There's some things we learned about pleasing God. There's some things we learned about sin. But we're going to tie that thing with a nice, neat bow today. We're going to finish the thought today. Now, we're still going to be in the very beginning of the Bible. You can't even see the pages. Okay? That's how long it took for man to be created, to rebel, and to degenerate to a point to where God had enough. So much that he destroyed all of mankind and every other animal on earth. You can't even see how thin this is. That's how quickly we degenerated. And that even, this even includes the time of the flood all the way back to the point where Noah was ready to repopulate the earth. You can't even see. This is how quickly sin can cause us to de degenerate. And so I can tell you now that the text will be found in the book of Genesis chapter 8. And the primary text will be verses 20 and 21. But we will be covering, actually, uh, verses 13 through 21 
in Genesis chapter 8. And just in case you want to mark your Bibles, we will be revisiting Genesis chapter 4. And we will be focused on verse 7 when we go there. Is that all right? Amen, amen, amen. amen. Now, what we're going to do is I'm going to read Genesis chapter 8. And we're going to read verses 13 through 21. And then we're going to go back and revisit chapter 4. And so I'm going to begin at 13. And it came to pass in the 600th and first year and in the first month and the first day of the month, the waters were dried up off of the face of the earth. This is, these are the flood waters that came from the rain and also from the waters of the deep. And Noah removed the covering off of the ark, and he looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. Now, verse 14, and in the second month, notice this is the second month, and on the seven and twentieth day, that's the 27th day of the month, was the earth dried. So notice, yes, the surface looked dry, but it really wasn't dry. It took another couple months to actually dry out. Amen? Amen. And now in verse 15, and God spoke unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife, and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee. Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee of all flesh, both of fowl and of cattle. And when we say cattle, we're talking about other animals as well. And of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And they may breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. And now he gets to the human beings. And Noah went forth and his sons and his wives and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, every fowl, and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth after their kinds, went forth out of the ark. And so what we have now is God, of course, got upset. And he said, I regret that I ever made mankind. And he decided to destroy all of mankind and all of the animals as well. And so the rain has stopped, and the <coughs> floodwaters have receded, and now the ground is dry. It's time to push the reset button. It's time to try this thing all over again. And so ultimately, our greatest instruction we're going to find in the next couple verses. I just wanted to set the stage. I wanted to give you the context where these next couple verses come into play. And we're going to tie them back into chapter 4 and learn what God wants us to learn today. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's read, now that we've set that stage, we will read verses 20 and 21. And Noah builded an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast and every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, a sweet frang fragrance in other words, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. Now, this may not seem like a lot. Okay, the waters have receded, and Noah is prepared. He's poised with his family to repopulate the earth. And we see that Noah is offering an offering. Seems like no big deal. And we see that God has decided not to do something again that he's done in the past. But what may not be readily apparent is that this is one of the most critical turning points that you will ever see anywhere in the Bible, save maybe Jesus' birth, his burial, and his resurrection. It certainly is on par with Abraham and God's promises in terms of the fact that this is a change in God's relating to mankind. 
This is a transition point from God having created man in his goodness, saying along with all of the rest of creation, and it was good. And man who is now fallen. This is the moment in time where God is acknowledging the fact that he's dealing with a whole different situation. And we in understanding this, can understand our situation better, hopefully, and therefore relate to God even better. Is that all right? So now, let's go back to chapter 4. For those of you who were here last week, this will be review. And those of you who were not, not so much. Amen. And so as I said before, we have Cain and Abel, the first two children of Adam and Eve. And when we get to verse 7, we see that God is speaking to Cain because Cain had become angry and his countenance has fallen. He's got his face all turned up. He's angry and he is upset and he is jealous of his brother because God did not respect or accept his offering. Now, if Cain had the right frame of mind and heart, he would have felt sorry. He would have been frustrated. He would have wanted to know, well, how do I get God's positive attention? But instead, he got angry, vindictive. And God is coming to Cain, and he is trying to instruct him. And ideally... When God speaks to us, when he either chastises us or tries to counsel us, our hearts and our minds and our ears would be open. Is that all right? But let's see what happened here with, between God and Cain. It says, this is God speaking to Cain. And, and by the way, uh, I'm just going to go back one verse because I love the way God operates. Uh, he asks a question. And when God asks a question, he knows the answer to the question. However, when he asks a question, uh, he's really telling you something. He's not usually really asking you a question of this type. And so the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Or why art thou wroth in the King James? And why is your countenance fallen? Now he knew how Cain felt. He knew about the offerings, and he knew that he did not pay any mind to Cain's offering. But he asked him anyway, and it was a rhetorical question. He didn't expect an answer, but he was about to explain some things to Cain in regards to his reaction to God's ignoring his offering. He says, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? If you had done what I wanted you to do, if you had done what you knew would please me in the first place, wouldn't I have accepted your offering? Didn't you go into this knowing that? If you had done well, would I have not accepted it? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And really, we talked about this last week, that lieth at the door. Actually, the word that it comes from means to crouch down, preparing to pounce. So if you find yourself, we're not just talking about doing something bad. If you find yourself not trying to do good, then you're leaving yourself open. And sin crouches at the door. Ready to what? What does it say after that? It says, and unto thee shall be his desire. He wants to have you. He wants to grab you and pounce on you and have you unto himself. That is sin. And this is talking about bringing an offering. This is talking about you think you've done something because you're given to God what you want him to have. It looks normal. It looks good. It looks noble from the outside and the undiscerning eye. But to God, it's not what he wanted. It's not what pleases him. You're giving him what you want him to have. 
And how many of us still have an area we need to work on, still have something that God is expecting more of us, but we've bartered with him, we've negotiated with him, and so we do a little bit more of this in order to avoid and make ourselves feel okay about not fixing that. So maybe we visit a little bit more. Maybe we give a little bit more financially. Whatever it is that we do, we think that that's going to make up for the thing that God really wants from you. So Cain, no, your fruits and vegetables are not good enough. Your attitude in giving it is not good enough. I need your best and I need your first. And I need it to come from a love for me, an honoring for me, an acceptance of my rules, my regulations, my commandments, because you understand that I know best. That my wisdom is a healing wisdom. That's what I want to see be the fruits of my relationship with you. Anything else is not good enough. Anything else I'm not accepting. And Cain is blessed in this regard in that God is stopping everything to attend to him. Stopping everything to counsel him. Isn't that nice to have one-on-one -on -one attention from God? One-on-one. -on -one. And so he's coming to Cain and he's telling him, if you're not trying to please me, you're in trouble. Because sin is waiting to pounce on you and to have you. And as we all know, that despite this counsel, where God says sin is waiting to crouching to have you, and yet he tells Cain, but you should have dominion over sin. You should have rulership over sin. But if you're not trying to please me, you won't be able to. You won't be able to. And so we know that Cain went on to kill his brother. And so one of the issues that we put on the table last week was whether or not Cain was just a bad seed or was he a seed that was corrupted. God approaches Cain and he tells him that if you do good. Now, this tells you that there's hope. There's a, there's a sound of hope in there. If you do good, you know you would be accepted. But if you're not doing good, you got trouble on your hands. There is a sound of hope. There is the idea that he isn't a bad seed, but he is a seed that because he did not do good, the good that he could, the good that he should, that he was in trouble. Sin crouches at the door waiting to pounce on him and on us. And so there is this issue, for those of you who study psychology, of nature versus nurture. Are we a tableau rasa, meaning a blank slate, or even better than that, do we start out good, or do, can we start out bad? Given the fact that God is here approaching Cain and telling him what he could have done, what he might have done, and the outcome thereof, and the outcome from the kinds of actions that he saw come from Cain, that leads us to believe that we might come in this, to this thing all right. That we might come into this thing as a seed that doesn't start out corrupted, but becomes corrupted as sin pounces on us because we create the opening. Well, we're going to answer those questions today. Amen? Is that all right? Amen. We're going to answer this question. So now, that takes us back to chapter 8. Amen. Amen. And we're going to focus now on verses 20 and 21. And this lesson may come quickly or I might take a while. <laughs> we're going to see about that. And so we have mankind having his opportunity to be fruitful and multiply. Understand, God wasn't mad at Noah's family. Noah was a, a righteous man. He was a man that walked with God, and therefore 
he afforded himself the opportunity to be the progenitor of all of what we have now become. And as he prepared to do that, here are the events that happen in these two quick verses. Noah, what's the first thing that Noah did? After God has told him, be fruitful and multiply, it's all yours. The first thing that he does is he builds an altar unto God. And so he likens himself unto Abel in this regard. He's giving God the first and the best. He is letting us know that in his time in the ark, he didn't lose his relationship with God. He could have gotten the big head. I'm the one and only. Yeah, I'm the man. But no, the first thing that he, thing that he does, the first opportunity that he had, he set an example for his family as to how they should comport themselves in the life after the flood. Just like we should in life after the chains. And so Noah built an altar unto the Lord. And he took every clean beast and every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. What does that mean? Now, some will take this and try to put it into a Judaism type of a context, talking about the animals that were clean and not clean. We don't know for sure what determine cleanness and uncleanness in terms of this part of the Bible. We do know, however, when God was telling Noah to put the animals into the ark, he did mention take the clean and the unclean. Amen? Yeah. Just because they were ceremonially, ceremonially in some way unclean did not mean that God wanted them to be extinct. He created them, and he created them because he wanted them. Is that all right? Amen. So what we see here is that Noah is honoring God right up front. And he's honoring God the way God wants to be honored. He didn't honor God any way he wanted to. He didn't honor God later. He didn't procrastinate. He didn't put it off. He gave God the best, and he gave to God first. I wonder if any of us are still struggling with that. Are we struggling with giving God first? Or maybe we give God first, but we really don't give our best. Maybe we hold back. Maybe we delay. Maybe we say, God, I'm giving you this. I'm going to give you my best later. Maybe we put it off. God is talking to us about a relationship and a life after change and what he wants from us, how he wants to relate to us. Frankly, what makes him happy? He's being vulnerable. I want you to picture our God and your God being vulnerable. Here he is telling us what he wants. And when you do that with someone, when you tell someone your weaknesses, when you tell someone your hopes, your dreams, your desires, your needs from them, you put yourself in a position that they might not give it. You put yourself in a position you could say in a way of needing them. You put them in a position of making you happy or choosing not to. How does that feel? Have you ever been there? I would imagine that each and every one of us has been there somewhere along the way, making yourself vulnerable, allowing someone else to be that important. And God allowed Noah to be that important. He chose him as the only one left. And after the flood, if Noah had gotten out of there and not put God first and not get, get, gave God his best, that's all God was going to get was second best. That's all that there was for God to receive, the only human beings left. But we see here that in the beginning, in the new beginning, that Noah did the right thing. And he was in the lineage of Abel, and this is the spirit of Abel. Thank God. And so he offered the burnt offerings on the altar. And so really the most important verse that we're going to study today is verse 21. Because now that we've seen that 
through Cain's actions, man degenerated and deteriorated to a place that God regretted that he created him and he destroyed him almost entirely. But we see that there is a bit of redeeming value there where Noah comes out and he does the right thing in regards to God. But now in verse 21, we're learning about how to have this relationship. <coughs> we're learning about ourselves through our fathers, Cain and Abel, and we're learning about our God. And we're going to learn something about him through this reaction that he has to Noah's gifts. Verse 21 says, And the Lord smelled a sweet savor in the King James, or fragrance. And the Lord said in his heart, now I'm going to pause there. Noah has given the offering. God now experiences it, as some translations would say, a soothing smell. A sweet fragrance, obedience smells good to God. We show our love for God through our actions that please him, which is obedience. Why is it obedience? Because we know what pleases him because he tells us. He tells us what to do. It pleases him when we do what's in our own best interest. And so he smelled a sweet fragrance. But this is even more instructive. He said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. So remember when Adam sinned, God cursed the ground so that it was no longer as easy to deal with. And when Cain sinned and killed his brother, and his brother's blood trickled into the ground, God cursed Cain and told Cain, who was a tiller of the ground, he was a farmer, he said, the ground will no longer yield to you its strength. But we see here, after God's terrible disappointment and his reserving unto himself one man, and his family, and making himself this vulnerable, that as Noah emerged from the flood, loving God, revering God, appreciating God, and obeying God, and giving God his best and his first, God experiences that as a sweet fragrance, and as a result, God reveals to us a change of heart. I don't want you to think that God is not omniscient because he is. But we're going to experience God's understanding and not a revelation to him, but an acknowledgement of a truth. That you will not see the full acknowledgement in his dealing with Cain. He told Cain that if you're not pleasing me, sin waits at the door. But we're going to fully flesh that thing out in the just the next few minutes because it's not just sin as we think of it that waits at the door. So again, in verse 21, God says, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. Why would God say that? He cursed the ground with, uh, with uh, Adam and he cursed Cain via the ground with Cain, with Cain's situation. So why would he say, I'm not going to do that again? What has changed in relation to man? And the answer comes right after that. He says, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. The imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. And then he says, neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. This is, in general, God acknowledging 
that destroying man and starting over again will not fix the real problem. It's not going to fix the real problem. The real problem remains. And he's saying that even before the age of accountability, even during his youth, in other words, from the very beginning, the imagination of man's heart is evil. This is God acknowledging something about the man that he's now created. It wasn't that way when he created Adam. There's something different. When he created Adam, he was good, and everything around him was good, and every opportunity was there to live a long and fruitful life. But because of his actions, his life was cut off, and so was ours, and his spiritual life was marred for good. And the only thing that could fix that is Jesus that came down 2,000 years later. But let's delve into this just a bit. We need to do just a little bit of word study. So those of you who have your pens and your paper, there's something here for you today. Amen. And the key here is maybe to your surprise, this word imagination. This word that is translated, in the King James at least, as imagination. Now, it's translated in other versions all sorts of ways. Yet the key is here. Now, the way that it's written in most versions, and I'll read it again. It says, I will uh, not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake because, this says for in the King James, but it just means because, because the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. And most of the translations actually choose to use an action word. It chooses to act as if it is your impulses that are evil from the very beginning, your actions, your thoughts. And so we begin to think that this situation means that we are always going to contemplate a sin at each corner at each turn because our imagination of our heart is evil from the beginning. So it gives you the mind picture of the fact that at each turn in all sorts of situations, we're going to be thinking up what it is that we want and that will result in sin as if we're reliving it several times a day. That's what it gives you the picture of it, gives you the picture of a moving, living, evolving human being that's going to make decisions all throughout their lives that will result in sin because the very imagination of his heart is evil. That's the word picture that you get. But I'm going to give you a substitute picture. And in order to do that, you've got to go back to the origin of the writings. And so this word in the Hebrew that is translated imagination can be spelled two ways. The word is yetzer. Yetzer. That's Y-E-T-Z-E-R. And it can also be spelled, I said with an S, with is, which is also yetzer, uh, pronounced the same way. And this, it means form or conception or purpose. And it is a noun. Amen? It's a noun. It is the form, the conception, or the purpose, the thing that you might have in your mind, the way it's usually translated. We're going to come right back to that. This thing that you might have in your mind. Yet, sir, this is important. It's translated as your imagination. Okay, the imagination of your heart. Now, this word, however, has a counterpart. Some could say this word comes from this second word I'm going to give you. And it is just one letter is different, Yatzer, Y-A-T, 
Z-E-R. And this is an action word. This is a verb. And this is actually, both of these words are the same origin when the Bible says, God made the light, let there be light. And that's mostly where the Jewish folk use this verb or focus on this, these words. But let me help you understand what yatzer means because it's going to help us to know the best translation of yatzer. These are counterparts, remember. Now, yatzer, this verb, means to mold into form. Sort of like to squeeze into a shape or to frame a thing, especially as a potter would. So you're talking about moist, wet clay. And this word, yatzer, acting on the clay so that it becomes what was in the mind of the creator. So you've got this moist clay and yatzer working on it, and then it becomes what it is. Most of our understanding and our thinking about how to look at these verses that we were looking at, because we like to have hope, we would love for there to be hope for Cain, but there really was no hope for Cain, frankly. He was not going to listen to God despite having a personal audience, and there's a reason why. So this yatzer means to mold into form, especially as a potter. But yet, sir, now let's go back to that. Yet, sir, is the form. You can use it as a conception or a purpose or a thought, but that's not what was intended here. With Yatzer, you're talking about moistness and flexibility and malleability in the hands of the creator. But once he's gotten it into the form that he wants it and it dries, it is what it is. So with us, God used this yatzer on us as he created Adam. And Adam started out good. But because of the intervention of the enemy, the jealous devil that wanted to take away God's gift that he had given to himself, being mankind, he had corrupted us. And so that heart that was so formed by God in Adam and Eve was corrupted. And it wasn't in its original form anymore. It was not in its original form anymore. And so when you see in verse 21 where God says, I'm not going to curse the ground anymore because it's not going to do any good. It's because he's recognizing and acknowledging it's a done deal. His heart, its form now is evil. Not just an individual thought, not just some of his imaginations, not just sometimes, and it cannot be undone. The only way to solve this problem is going to be through my son, 2,000 years from now, but because his heart is evil from the beginning, it makes it all the more miraculous and makes God appreciate all the more a man or woman of God like Noah. It smells all the sweeter. The last time I had these guys on my mind and I acted on them, I was destroying things. And yet, not because of a good heart, but in spite of an evil heart, men and women like Noah acknowledge me for who I am, love me the way I deserve, treat me the way I want to be treated, offer me the first 
and the best despite having an evil heart. That's the beauty of truthfully predestination. Frankly, that's another con controversial subject over in the New Testament. God predestined that he was going to live eternally with and love those who loved him. That's what he made his mind up about up front. We get confused about, well, man, if he created us and then he also predestined some of us to hell, what kind of God would do that? No, he predestined that those that were going to love him and belong to him, those are the only ones that were going to be with him forever. And then we either accept his solution to this problem or we do not. The outcome will be permanent, however, and you will either be with God because you want to please him or you will be with God's enemy. And so with this understanding of the yatzer and the yetzer, Funny sounding words, but very meaningful. It's not the imagination of your heart. It's not just your thoughts that are flawed. You're going to have many thoughts, good and bad. It's not just your thoughts that are off. The very condition of your heart, not in its moist, malleable state, but in its dried state, is off. And yet, with a dried, marred heart, you can still love your God, appreciate your God, obey your God enough for him to be pleased. A broken vessel, God's vessel that he created us was whole and beautiful, and now it's broken. His gift is marred. And yet, he is so good that he has the ability to appreciate the best that that broken vessel can offer. That's a good God. We should be grateful for that kind of God, that kind of love, to have any kind of redeeming value. Because Noah wasn't perfect. Noah was going to sin. He had sin, and he would sin. But it's not an individual sin that damns you ultimately because you can, get, you can get around that through God's forgiveness as long as you love him and you mean it. But we're talking about metanoia versus metamelomai. Those who will live their lives in a spirit of metamelomai really never love God in the first place. And yet when you love God and you spend your time and your energy and your intentions trying to please him, you are going to make some mistakes. But God knows the difference between someone whose heart is turned toward him, yet they're imperfect, yet from their youth, from their very beginning, they came out flawed. They didn't get flawed. They came out flawed. God understands, and that's why he can still love you when you make a mistake because he knows you're flawed. But ultimately, the judge, the final judge is over in chapter 4 again. And I'm going to wrap up soon. The final judge is over here in chapter 4, and let's go back to that verse 7. It says, if you do well, I would have accepted you, and you know that. He puts it in the form of a question, of course. And if you do not well, then sin lies at the door, crouching, ready to have you. Notice that sin here is described not as a thing, not as an experience, not as an action, but as a person. Remember, you're flawed from the very beginning now, so it's not your individual sins that cause you to be flawed. You are already flawed. You come, out of the, you come out of the womb needing salvation. You come out of the birth canal needing Jesus. So it's not the first time you disobey your parents that you need a Savior. You need it before that. And so you come out with this condition. 
And so what's happening here is sin lies at the door. If you don't have a heart of metanoia, if you don't have a heart to love God, if you don't truly want to please him and you're really just about yourself, then it's not a singular sin that lies at the door. If you don't have a heart to please God, you're going to please somebody. All the times in your life when you're not trying to please God, you're trying to please somebody. Maybe it's you. Maybe it's some man or woman. Maybe it's your boss because what you want is what your boss has you think to give. So you please your boss. Now, if the promotion or the raise cometh from God, then it cometh from pleasing God. But if you're looking on the outside as if you are God's person, but really in your life and in your decisions, ultimately you're really not pleasing God, sort of Cain-like, then sin waits at the door, but not just a sin, the originator of sin waits at the door to have you. Not just one sin, one momentary sin can engulf you, embrace you, and have you, but the condition of your heart can cause sin to have you. And sin, the originator of sin and God, can't have you at the same time. You belong to one or the other. So what God is acknowledging over here in chapter 8 is that my creation is no longer what I made it to be. It's permanently broken. They come out wrong. So even though he gave Cain that speech, Cain and Abel were equally flawed from their mother's womb, equally broken vessels, hearts were equally malformed. They had a heart condition, if you will. But the difference with Cain is that Cain didn't, have a desire to please God. He wanted to please himself. He wanted to give God whatever he thought he needed to and whatever he thought he wanted to. But when you want God to be happy, we're talking relationship talk here. If you want God to be happy and pleased, remember, well, last week we talked about that word that's translated please. It actually means to make, make someone happy. Not just to meet the minimum criteria, to make them happy. And in doing so, you must give him what he asked for. So when God gives us a commandment, not only is it wrapped up with wisdom and in our best interest, but when we obey, we make him happy. Do you want to make God happy? Is your energy being used to make God happy? Is your money being used to make God happy? Are your decisions being made to make God happy? The truth is, our God, he knows. He knows the difference. So it doesn't matter when you live a life that looks good like Cain's. God's not going to pay any attention to that stuff. He's only going to give his attention to that which is good, that which is pleasing, that which he commanded, that that he wants. And yes, most of us are in a position unlike Cain to still be able to hear from God, to still avoid the horrible situation that Cain ended up in. But it was too late for Cain. Cain's mind was made up. Cain's mind was made up when he offered the offering. And so for us, we learn from Cain's example. Amen? Amen. And so ultimately, from our primary text, we get this, that God smelled a sweet fragrance, which is what he smells when any of us chooses in our hearts to love the one true and living God. Not because things are perfect, not because things are great, not because you are perfect, 
But when you press through the sin that you are shackled with, the sinful nature, the heartbrokenness that you are, that you come from, God acknowledges and appreciates you for your gifts that you give him. And so for someone, today is a day that you needed to be encouraged. And as you walk this walk and live this life after chains, God wants to not only warn us like he tried to do with Cain or warn us as he does to tell us how to live our lives better, he is also telling you that he sees and he knows and he cares about those things that you press on and do. Those things that you do that you know please him and it cost you something. He acknowledges it. He appreciates it. Just like this sweet fragrance from Noah's sacrifice. And it's because God knows that there are those out there that really, truly do love him. That he doesn't have to worry about being alone in eternity. He doesn't have to worry about just having angels with him in eternity. God knows that despite his enemy winning the battle, he did not win the war. And that there are those whose hearts beat toward him, even in their marred state. And they can and they will give him what he wants, when he wanted it, the way he wanted it, the first and the best of what he blesses them to have. And because of that, God can conclude, I'm not going to fool around trying to destroy these jokers any longer. They're broken from the beginning. It's not going to do any good anyway. I am not mad. I'm going to enjoy those who love me. And the others are going to go the way they're going to go. I'm going to be here. I'm going to be available. I'm going to send a preacher to them. I'm going to send somebody to them to tell them the truth. I'm going to love them just like I did Cain. But I'm not going to worry about the fact that, you know what? They're broken from the beginning. I've got a solution for them. It's readily available. And I love, enjoy, appreciate those who love me. And this is the message of this, these first events after the flood, the renewal the reset moment, the turning point where God let us in on how he was going to, how he's going to view his creation and therefore how he was going to relate to his creation. If your creation is broken from the beginning, so now the emphasis shall be on the solution to the eternal problem. So when I find a man, Abraham, that I believe I can trust enough that I can put all of my plans in through him. When I give him the law, now this is a law to make them understand what I already do. And that is you're flawed from the beginning. You're not a good seed that went bad. You're all flawed from the beginning. The law is meant to help us to recognize that and therefore to marinate us, to get us to be malleable again, to accept Jesus. So when the heart is malleable and Jesus is in it, then when it dries, who's inside? Jesus. This is what is happening at this turning point. And... In that little bit of the Bible, that little sliver, all of that went down. And the rest of what we study and know are the result of that outcome and God reaching out to his creation and ultimately pointing toward the solution to this fixed and eternal problem. And uh, we should be grateful to God for caring enough about us to not only have somebody write it, but to speak it to us. Amen? Amen.